Best round of Super Rugby Pacific to date. The crowds are back, the big players are out, the big teams performed. And I tell you what, the Crusaders were very good. The Blues looked sharp this week. The Reds got a massive win against the Brumbies. But I think it was the Chiefs. Without Brody Retallick, without Tupo Vai'i, they came out here in Sky Stadium in Wellington and got the job done. I tell you what, the contenders are now out. We know who they are. I can't wait for next week's action. Breakdown is brought to you by Neurofen Zavans. Available every day at Chemist Warehouse. Tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome into the breakdown for another evening. It is great to have you joining us. And we've got some special guests. The stallwater is still here. Mills Malia Ina, of course. But we've traded in the two silky wingers for the Brains Trust. Chelsea Semple, Stephen Bates. Great to have you two on the programme. Uh, Jeff's talking about the contenders being out. Who's out? Is it the Highlanders? Who are these contenders that are in? As you know, Kirst, I've been playing on my phone here and checking the table, and I, I don't know. I, I think they're all still in because the way I see it, there's six. You played six games more or less, and um, there's still 14 games in the regular season. And the Hurricanes who are in eighth, um, and the Hollanders are in 12th, and there's seven points that separate them. So there's still five to seven games to go, depending on who you are. Well, we're only round seven of Super Rugby, aren't we? And I tell you what, we have had tries galore to start the season. We have hit the $100,000 mark in the Tries for Tonga initiative. All that money will go straight to the Red Cross appeal to help out our Pacific Island neighbours which is just brilliant. And how good has the action been, Mills? Charles, so good. Oh, it's been so good. It's been an awesome, awesome week of rugby. When you talk about the tries and $100,000 already raised, fantastic. And so um, it's, it's growing as well. Um, the ch Charles, the way that, you know, the teams are sort of evolving as well. Yeah, first of all, what an awesome um, thing to accomplish, raising $100,000. Um, and yeah, you're right, Mel, it was a really exciting week of rugby. We had the, the double up with the Moana Pacifica boys against the Blues, which were two great games and two great games to be part of. Also having the crowds back made such a difference in the atmosphere and I think... You know, you could see it in the players as well. They were, they were playing for their fans that were there supporting them. And then um, that, that Crusaders-Highlanders game on Friday, I don't quite know what to make of that one. I can't quite put my finger on what went on in the second half there. But again, backed up with, um, with the Chiefs. Kane's game today, which was fantastic, and, and the Chiefs to get the job done. I'm, I'm really proud. You've just summarised it all perfectly. <laughs> there you for go. Us, Charles. So let's get into Super Rugby action then with our brand new sponsors, our new supporters that we've got on board. Super Rugby with Nurofen available at Chemist Warehouse. Well, we'll tuck in straight away to what happened in Wellington this afternoon. We had afternoon football, and it was so great, wasn't it? Running rugby at its best, the Chiefs getting it done by one point. All eyes were on Geordie Barrett before this game, Stephen, but there was one man that I upstaged him and Joshuaani. I'll just say first and foremost how cool Sunday afternoon. Yeah. That is an awesome time for your family to go watch the rugby as well, but also as a player, it's awesome to play while well, it's sunny. But yeah, Josh was really, really good too. Really good combination between him and 12, but um, through the first intercept, and then from there you wonder how his confidence is. Yeah. He's a confidence player. That didn't seem to affect him, as you see, by well, that pass there. Still had the ability to throw, went through the line, as you see on this one here, offloading, setting up tries. So um, he's probably played second fiddle to Bryn, uh, Gatlin, um, for the the first part of the season, but he certainly uh, put his hand up and said, hey, don't forget about me, follows as well. So he was really good today. Yeah, I, I love seeing um, Joshuani performing today after he made the move up to the Chiefs. Obviously a big move for him, a big call to, to look for a different environment and more game time. And yeah, he, he made, some, made some magical things happen. I thought early on, you know, he made a couple of really good breaks um, and I thought he might have got caught in the trap of, of then trying to run with the ball too much because it was working and he did get stopped a few times where he probably could have passed. But um, yeah, he adjusted and, and he got better and better as the game went on. It was unfortunate he went on towards the end there with, with an injury, but I think he's going to have some huge confidence coming out of that game. Mills, I know you're excited to see Jordy Barrett play at 12 today. He's come out. He came out on Friday and said, this is my position, this is where I want to be. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, the fact that he wants to go, that we all know he sort of started there, particularly when he played you know, for Canterbury and sort of what he'd done there. Oh, a few years ago, I thought that would be his position, but there was obviously an opening in terms of uh, in the fullback role with... Um, with, with the All Blacks, and so he's taken that on his, you know, on his shoulders as well. He's absolutely nailed it. 
wasn't quite his best today, but it just goes to show how difficult you know the positions are or how different they are. You know, when yeah. you're playing at the back, you've got so much time, there's a bit more contact here, there's also a bit more voice and direction, Batesy. So um, the thing is, going forward, you know, what does he do now? He's come out and saying that he's, he wants to play second five. Does he stay there? I reckon I agree with him. I reckon probably today didn't really go his way, you know, and, and sometimes games go like that. I don't think he was fantastic or set the world on fire today, and that's not necessarily his fault, you know what I mean? Sometimes games don't go like that, but the hard thing is to say, well, he didn't he didn't have the influence today, so let's just chuck him back to fullback. Yeah. So if we all buy in, which I mean we, is if the Hurricanes buy in, the All Blacks buy in, and they want to play him as a second five, you just got to give him time there because we know he is a fantastic rugby player, isn't he? He can play wherever he wants, just need to give him a bit of time there. Chopping and changing mills, you'd probably know better than, than most, but it's pretty difficult, I reckon. I, I agree with you there, Batesy, as well. It's time in the saddle for me. At this level, at Super Rugby level, when the games are, are this high quality, you can't expect a player to, to switch into a position he's never played in that team before and expect him to perform at his best and, and be miraculous in one game. So, look, I think um, if the Hurricanes want, want to make this work, I mean, they've had five different 12s in five games, so... Um, they haven't got much consistency there, but if, if Geordie's coming out saying, you know, I want to be a 12, and he's, he's just got to have time, time in the saddle, and he's got to back up game after game playing at 12. Basically, let's talk about the number eights because they have been superb. We'll start off with the Chiefs first because we talk about the big players, the Brody Retallicks, the Sam Keynes, but you think the Chiefs are a better side when Peter Garsawakula is in there? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, think, I think 100% they are, and I, I think... Last week when he didn't play against the Crusaders, they miss him. Like, he's their go-to man, and he, you even saw it today off the back of the scrum with runs like this, and this is not the only one. I just think he's the guy that gets their back line moving. He's the one that dents the line and then lets them play off the back of it. He's got speed, he's aggressive, and, and I, if there's one guy I don't want to lose if I, I'm the Chiefs, it's him, because I think he does so much for the side. Then we have to be talking about him in that international frame, don't we? Well, you have to be. And he's probably on the back end of you know what we're talking about in terms of um, you know Geordie. The fact he's got confidence, he's got consistency in that role. Over the years, he's sort of you know he's made a couple of mistakes and then he's sort of you know gone off his game. He's now getting that sort of stability in his game. And in fact, that is you know everything you know evolve, evolves around him in terms of getting that front football. Um, you know when he goes off or, or he makes a mistake, he, he quickly forgets about that stuff. But that, that just comes from you know time in the settle. Like you, you're spoken but also experience, Charles. Yeah, and, and speaking about experience, you know, this guy, when he when he broke onto the scene, he, he was so good with ball in hand, he could make a few good hits, but it was his work off the ball that probably needed a bit of polishing, and, and like you said, Mills, that comes with experience. But I've been watching him off the ball the last few weeks, and his work rate is through the roof. He He's the my favourite person to watch cleaning rucks. He's just got the best best technique, and he makes the other teams feel it. So he's growing, he's going to continue to grow. Do I think he should be an all-black selection? 100% contender. Well, we'll find out in a couple of months, won't we? I'm gutted that JK is not here today because he will be sitting in Sydney absolutely crying after the Blues' performance. Three games in eight days and they absolutely nailed it. But we've got two Blues here. We can call you a Blue, can't Chiefs. we? Chiefs. <laughs> well, exactly. Where do you two sit? Are you Blues men today? Mills, you weren't convinced by the Blues a couple of weeks ago. Are you convinced by them now? Are they real title contenders? I think they're getting there. I'm still... What I'm not convinced about is their ability to really push on. They keep teams in the fight. So they've got the quality, the quality there, you know, the players around them, the X factor as well, and some finishes. But they seem to just leave that sort of opening for teams to, to, to come back. And when you're playing top stuff, when you get closer to the finals, you know that's the opportunity for them to really, you know, push that momentum. They haven't quite got it. Perhaps it's, you know, built around the fact they've had some disruption. I think a key area for me really is, is around their leadership. You know, when you've got. Dalton playing consistently and, and hopefully he's back now for a, a while and he's got some um, you know, good leadership guys around him, then perhaps that will grow. Perhaps some of those decisions will, will start to grow. But I, what concerns me a lot is when they score points and there's a, they leave it an opening there for teams to really come back and, and sort of you know, bite them. And then you, know, you, you have, a, you have a, a game where they're, 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 they seem to try and blow out. But they keep, they keep teams in the fight and then it becomes an arm wrestle and that's where they tend to go wrong. I think you're, when you're talking about that, Mills, as well, you're talking about, like, at the end of the day, you want everyone in motion at the end of the season. The one thing that many teams, but I'll, we're talking about the Blues at the moment, have had to deal with is the constant COVID disruption and stuff like that. And they've had to not name teams until the Thursday because of that, and then it changes on the Saturday. So I suppose the one thing, the two things I'll, I'll bring up from the Blues' point of view is, one, is that the whole squad is playing. 
which has got to be good for the squad. And the other thing is, too, are they absolutely killing it at the moment? No, I think it's fair to say they're not. You know, I think that's fair to say. I, I don't think that anyone would say they're killing it. But what they are is they are five from six. And the one game they lost, they should have won. You know what I mean? So there, there is positives there for them. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying that the, the Blues are killing it at the moment, but there is certainly positives there, I believe. Well, let's talk about a couple of those positives because, Charles, we were there yesterday and a couple of youngsters really stood out, didn't they? We're talking about Corey Evans and Anton Signer. Yeah, look, I'm, uh, I haven't seen much of Corey Evans, to be honest. I, I, I didn't really know much about him before, before yesterday, but, look, I like what I saw with him with ball in hand. He, he went out there looking confident. He's got good footwork. He's able to beat defenders. Um, and he He's big and strong, and I think for a young guy like this, I mean, he's going to have the likes of Riku Iwani, he's got Stephen Perifeta there, Bowden Barrett coming back in. With those guys around him, he's only going to just continue to grow. If he keeps this same youthful kind of um, just keenness to get out there and have a go, um, I think, you know, someone with huge potential. And Anton Segner has been impressive in the last two performances, hasn't he? Yeah, he just goes to work, doesn't yeah. he? And for a young man who's 20, turns 21 this year, um, he's had to play back-to-back -back games and he just goes about his business. You know, he's workman-like, he gets into everything. He's played, obviously, you know, uh, Moana, who are known for their physicality, and he didn't go missing whatsoever. So, And this is what I talk about a little bit from the Blues. So you've got two guys there who last year were under 20, you know, in the under 20. So, you know, there is, there is positive signs coming through. Is this like? poetry and motion for you, watching this? Oh, I love, I'll be, I'm a big Corey Evans fan, I'll be honest with you. He was the um, Blues 20s um, Player of the Year last year and a wonderful young kid out of uh, Auckland Grammar. And um, the thing I like about Corey the most is he's been through adversity to get where he is, three ACLs, you know, wow. at 20 years of age. So wow. he's gone through a bit to get where he is. Is he probably, he's probably a little bit behind where he is if, he, if he didn't have those ACLs, but he's been through adversity and I just hope he kicks off. OK, well, what about Kurt Eklund? He stole the show, didn't he? Because he scored a hat-trick. Uh, just the first ever Blues hooker to score three tries in a single game. I'll tell you who'll be jealous about that one. It's James Parsons Mills. Yeah, he will be, uh, for sure. I mean, <laughs> tell me, is this, is this part of when you sit down with hookers these days, Batesy, <laughs> that part of their repertoire is they have to score tries from the back of the, 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 the driving wall? Come on, mate. But they're not doing anything. They're just, <laughs> they're just hanging on back there, aren't they? Every, all the work's been done up front, and then I think Luke... Um, Romano said the most. All they're doing is they're jumping, they're just jumping on the back of the tow bar and yeah. going for a ride. Love so, that call. Yeah. I tell you what, in, in the women's game, it's actually quite common that um, girls start trans transitioning into the Ford pack as they get older. And I'm <laughs> kind of thinking, Charles, are you saying you're going to go like, there? Oh, well, mate, if you're going to get a hat trick in a car. <laughs> By hanging on the tow bar on the back like that, then why not? Well, I'll tell you what, Kurt Eklund uh, must have got his inspiration from Mills in South Africa. Playing the bill, uh, Bulls, you, what, scored four, was it? Did I? Oh, I think that must have been a wee while ago. <laughs> uh, yeah. oh, you've got oh, that in your, oh, no, on your on greatest repeat, hits. <laughs> you've got yeah. that on repeat, Mills. No, is that oh, what you get when you're sitting in the JK seat? Hey, the old the back to switch choice. a play to Schumacher on the short side. Picked up by Muliaina. Almost there, over. <laughs> Way too easy. My Murray, away to Spencer. Little dummy off. Beautiful ball to Mulia Ina. That is a superb piece of work. And he's got it. Well, it was a quick throw. Not an accurate throw. Johnny on the spot. Now Spencer yes, putting the right, kick in for the corner. Mulia Ina giving chase. Here's number four. Pick your own jersey sizes back there, or? <laughs> it's quite big. <laughs> We're a lot smaller back then. Hey, we, didn't have, we didn't have to do too much gym work in the, in the, in the gym, so. C come on, you've showed your kids those. Oh, no, no, I'll probably see it tonight now. <laughs> They'll be asking for it for their bedtime stories from now on. Uh, righto. Friday night, Crusaders took on the Highlanders. It wasn't a convincing performance, but it was a victory for the Crusaders. Uh, tough one to watch, though, Batesy. Second half was tough to watch. Mm. Yeah, I'll be honest with you. It was quite... It, was, it kept you enthralled because of the closeness of the contest. Yeah. But as a spectacle, I don't think it was probably the greatest game, a lot of drop ball and stuff like that, and it could have gone sort of either way. But these these uh, tussles between these two, especially in Christchurch, funny enough, always are really tight, aren't they? But it wasn't the greatest spectacle. But as I said, the closest of the game kept you on the edge of your seat, kept you enthralled. The Highlanders were in this, weren't they? They had chances and they just didn't capitalise on them. Um, Mills, for someone like a Mitch Hunt, who didn't have his best game out there, what do you do if you're coaching him? 
Well, you, I mean, obviously, Tony Brown's come out and sort of really backed him. Yeah. But he's a player that's been around, you know, the tracks for a, for a very long time. He, he started well in, in, in the fight, but, you know, a couple of really, um, you know, big mistakes, um, especially when they're, you know, going forward and, and opportunities to actually, you know, you know win the game. Mm -hmm. You've got to get his confidence back because he is a confidence player. Uh, and we've seen what, we, what he can do when, he, when he's right on the job. So... He'll be hurting today um, and, and throughout the week, and it's it's and it's pure that he gets you know, back on the job. Yeah, I think that that's where you see a good player come come back in, right? If they have a, sh a shocker, as Mitch will probably not be happy with his performance, but he's the type of guy that'll go away and, and review his review his game and come back next week stronger. Um, I think this game, you know, the Landers knew they needed to win, and I think the most frustrating thing for them is that you never hardly ever get to play the Crusaders when they're not playing their best rugby. Um, and, and for the Crusaders to perform like they did in the second half was really, it wasn't like them. So, you know, there, there was an opportunity there for the Landers to, to capitalise on that and get some points on the board and, and beat their nemesis in the Crusaders. Um, but both teams just, just couldn't quite finish things off in that second half. I'll tell you who was performing through the roof uh, for the Crusaders, and that was Fletcher Newell. This is a guy that many people wouldn't know his name, Batesy, and he was a rock on the weekend. A couple of years ago, um, he was Young Player of the Year, you know what I mean? So he's been around, and uh, the Crusaders in Canterbury have obviously known about him. And we've always known he's a, he's a big lump of a lad, I'd say. He's <laughs> 130 plus, I reckon he's a big, big young man. But what a sort of impressed me, which I hadn't seen much of, and he obviously can do, is his ability to carry the ball. Mm. So, you know, and, and as we look forward, and I'm getting, I'm just getting <laughs> too carried away here, but Say if we it. look forward to, like, if we look forward to, like, All Blacks and stuff, I'm getting carried away. I'm the not putting him in that picture, you know what I mean? But yeah. we need those kind of people that can carry the ball, because if we've seen anything from the Six Nations, yeah. they've got plenty of those guys, and we need a few more of those now. I'm not saying he's in that category now, but the ability to do it, I haven't seen that from him before. Well, so I'll say on. the word for you. Uh, people are already talking about potentially an All Blacks bolter, and if we're talking about the All Blacks mills, where does Falau Whakatawa stand? Oh, jeez, it's been so good, you know, that he's been back after that sort of injury and, and what he did, a couple of nice re breaks. He's such a, he's such a threat too. And um, where does he sit? Oh, he's right in the mix. Um, so we've got some real quality sort of halfbacks. You talk about, you know, Brad Weber, yeah. uh, TJ Pedernara obviously coming back, um, you know, Christie as well. Um, but he just brings something sort of really different. You, you, you notice the edge when he comes onto the, onto the field um, and his ability just to like, you know, sniff out little wee opportunities like that. It's unfortunate he didn't get any support with him. But man, he is, he's X Factor. Yeah, but for me, Whakatawa is um, the best impact nine that we've got in the country. We've got so many great starting nines and we're so lucky with the, with the quality of halfbacks we've got. But a guy like Whakatawa could come on in the last 15, 20 minutes of a game and just bring something completely different and change things up. And I think, you know, that's something that, that coaches would love about him. I'll tell you what, considering the Highlanders haven't won a game this season and the Crusaders are the best performing New Zealand side right now, there's not a lot between yeah. the top and the bottom, is there? Yeah, well, I say, we're looking at the table before the Landers are last, and yeah. you got to feel for them a little bit because I, I don't have the stats at the top of my head. But oh, come on, baby. See, that's how we got you on. <laughs> Sorry. The stats I, I do, I just don't want to show off. But <laughs> <laughs> they've been close in all of them, you know what I mean? But they haven't got one yet. So you do have to feel a little bit sorry for them and, and let's hope they can pick one up and maybe, as, um, as you said, Chelsea, maybe the confidence can grow from that. You know, you've got to feel for them a little bit. As we know, it's round seven. They're not out yet. You've <laughs> done the calculations. You won't share the stats with us, but we know. We know. OK, time now for your trivia question. And I tell you what, we've got a little surprise. We've got a treat for you <laughs> because we've actually got a special guest with your question today. Watch this. Hi guys, my name's Scott, and my question is, who's the only New Zealand rugby player to play 50 tests, 100 provincial games, 100 super games, and win a Rugby World Cup? How is that for symmetry? If you're a numbers person... I know you're a stats man. No, I'm not a stats man. I'm looking at Mills and he's always confused. Oh, always confused hey. when it comes to this oh. career. I'm looking at Charles as the brains trust to come up with the goods. You know what? You've got a good break to be able to think about things. So no have googling. a good think. <laughs> have a good think. Uh, you can play along at home uh, as well, of course. But first of all, we've got another Jersey's tale. And if Jersey's could talk, imagine the stories they could tell, especially if you're Jeff Wilson. Well, if I've got to talk about four jerseys, it's time for me to go and find them.
So after an extensive search in the attic, uh, to be fair, one was hanging up. One special one was hanging up in the closet, uh, and that was the All Black jersey, the first All Black jersey. So this is first test is against Scotland at Murrayfield in November. So that means it's cold, really, really cold. So you're thinking to yourself, be nice to warm up in a changing room, be nice to prepare for a normal, normal game of rugby. You get to Murrayfield and they demolished half of the stand and they built a new stand and we're warming up and getting changed in a pop-up marquee. And it's, I'm thinking it's zero degrees, I'm thinking to myself, the ground's gonna be frozen, what sort of test match is this going to be? I was grateful of one thing in particular, it had long sleeves, it was an unbelievable day. Um, and, and as a, an All Black, you never forget it, you know, your first test jersey, and I was fortunate enough to, to score a couple of tries and kick a goal, and the team played really, really well, and it's the, it was the perfect, perfect start. That's the, the only long sleeve All Black jersey I ever played in. Six months earlier, 993 was a crazy year, crazy year. This was a surreal two weeks. This is representing a New Zealand at cricket. And out of the blue at the end of a season, wasn't, you know, I, I thought my cricketing season was over, my gear was in Invercargill, I was in Dunedin. I get the news, I'm in the New Zealand cricket team going, and I'm going, what? And then I'm all of a sudden playing with Martin Crow and Andrew Jones and Danny Morrison. Tony Blaine came into the side, it was just a, a crazy, crazy two weeks, five one-day internationals against Australia. And uh, same thing, long-sleeved, middle of summer. Makes perfect sense, right? I'm almost certain this is the one that um, I uh, used in Hamilton when I got to hit the winning run, which was pretty cool, which was, which was amazing, but a long, long time ago. So that's sort of 1993 in two jerseys, which is crazy, crazy to think. And then, you know, I suppose a team that was always special to me, but an era uh, was always special to me was Otago Rugby and my time with them. And so this is a this is a '98 jersey. Um, that was the year we won a, a, a national title, won the uh, NPC. Yeah! Played at fullback. Uh, just great bunch of guys. Great to reward a great fan base that have been so loyal to to the team and and. There was still a touch of amateurism about this, to be fair. You know, in terms of we were, we were enjoying both on and off the field. It, it hadn't really evolved into what you see now. And lastly, it's the original, not the beige uniform, but when it made the comeback for the T20, the first T20 International, and I'd sort of come back into cricket, and it was at Eden Park. We had afros, we had guys with mows, we had the whole lot, you know, and so we're playing Australia thinking to ourselves, well, this will be a bit of hit and giggle, this will be a bit of fun. 12 years in the wilderness and a black jersey, an all black jersey. Welcome back, Jeff. Playing against Ricky Ponting and Glenn McGrath and uh, Brett Lee charging and bowling 150 odd clicks. It was just an amazing experience, and to do it at Eden Park, it was a big crowd, so much fun, so much energy, and to probably get hit for one of the biggest sixes in the history of the game. Um, Ricky Ponting hit me this, and it was not the worst delivery I've ever bowled. I bowled worse, but it was right in his slot, and he off, it, was, it was sort of on his hip, and he hit the, the front edge of the ASB stand. That's a big hit, you know, like it. If it had not hit the lip, I think it would have gone over. But the, the embarrassing thing about hitting the lip is that you know that when it drops straight back down onto the field, and you're like, that would have gone a long, long way. People do remember that. Stephen Fleming reminds me quite often how far that went. But I think to me, it was just a memorable day, you know. And then you think where, what's happened post then. Um, you know, it was, uh, it was pretty cool to be a part of and to, to, to have a genuine beige New Zealand cricket shirt. It's pretty cool. Welcome back into the breakdown. Great to have you joining us. Well, what do you reckon? Have you got the answer to our trivia question? Who played 50 tests, 100 NPC matches, 100 Super Rugby matches and won a Rugby World Cup? If you think you know these guys, they've all been studying very hard <laughs> during the break. Mills? I'm going to say it's a tight five. Uh, Ellie Williams. Charles? <clears throat> well, I initially was thinking Liam Messon, but I don't think he's actually played 50 tests. So I'm lost from there. Unsure? Yeah. Batesy? 
I know you're, you've always got the good knowledge oh, against no, that memory thing. I'm terrible at stats. <laughs> I was going to say Jerry Collins, to be honest with you, but, um, yeah, I'm not sure, to be honest. I, I've wrecked the memory bank and I've got zero confidence. Can I have another go? Can I have two answers One since more. he's not answering? Yeah. Tony Woodcock. OK, none of you are right, even with your two answers, Mills. Uh, here is the answer, and a big thank you to Scott Wright for sending in that question. Here it is. Jimmy, the oh, C. Jimmy, you should have known that, Mills. should have known that. Come on, Jesus. you won't be getting your bluff oysters this year. I know more, now I have to die for my own. <laughs> That's an impressive stat. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? It is. Amazing stats. Uh, the numbers may not have been 100% accurate, but round about... <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, they were the absolute minimum. They were the minimum of what he played. At least 50 tests, at least 100 games. Here are his stats. 51 caps, 111 games for Southland, 108 for the Highlanders, uh, and, of course, a member of the 2011 Home Rugby World Cup victory. Jimmy Cowan. Very impressive, Jimmy. Very impressive. I hope you did better than these guys and girls <laughs> did on the panel. I know my husband's uh, screaming at the television because <laughs> there's a book of knowledge. But... Also, if you would like to send in your trivia question, you can be live on the breakdown as well. Send your questions into Sky Sport Rugby's Instagram account. Slide into the DMs and we will try and get you on. Uh, well, time now. We're going to get Jeff Wilson back on the program because a little bit earlier, uh, he caught up with one of the assistant coaches of the Hurricanes because it was a busy weekend for the referees, wasn't it? Digging deep into their pockets. Well, team, obviously it's been a challenging week for Super Rugby Pacific. A number of red cards. Chris Gibbs, assistant coach here of the Hurricanes, giving us some time. And Gibbo, you think about this week, it's, it's a challenging time for the game. Your assessment of what's sort of happened, is it just an anomaly, the fact we've gone through these games, and particularly around the collision area? I don't. Yeah, I, th I think the key thing we've got to understand about this whole thing is, is that you know we're talking about red cards and, and people in people's minds. That's about foul play, but it's actually not. And you know that's the one thing we've got to get our mindset shift around. And the reality is, is that you get poor te technique and you get yourself in a bad situation, you are responsible. And the outcome that we're seeing at the moment is red cards. And, and we saw that when we, when the coaching staff, in particular the Blues, talked about the fact that they need to work with Nepo Lalala in terms of cleaning that up. But how much do the players themselves have to take an individual? Individual responsibility. Yeah. Is it a case that coaches can only do so much? I think so, but it's our, you know, we've got a duty of responsibility to make sure that people are accountable to their actions and making sure that we're coaching good technique and all of those sorts of things. And I think, you know, there are some just some unlucky situations at the moment, and I think probably case of point was last night, but you know, it, it is what it is, it's head and that's a red card. And, and that's the first port of call, right? I mean, player welfare is the most important that's, thing above all else? Yep, you put the player at the centre of all conversations around safety and it, that's just the reality of where we are nowadays and, you know, the head's sacred and we know the outcomes of, of people who have played on with, with, uh, with, you know, concussions and it's not a good outcome. After a week like this, do you expect there to be some conversations in there, terms of what has happened? Yeah, I think there needs to be. I think, like I said before, you know, we've got a responsibility as a coaching group to make sure that our individuals are clear and we understand that. And look, you know, good technique, that's what we're after. And, uh, you know, put yourself in the right position. So that's kind of, yeah, it's, it's a tough one, mate. I really understand it's tough. Yeah, and the nature of the game, it's a physical contest, right? Yeah, it's, it's gladiatorial in some parts of it. But do you think it's really important, though, for everyone that this is the example yeah. uh, for, for everyone that plays the game, the fact that we want, I suppose, kids, the community to understand yeah. that this is not an everyday happening. Yeah. This is quite often just the highest level? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's the, that's the key part, isn't it? You know, and I think safety for, is paramount, and we just got to make sure that, you know, it is a massive physically uh, physical sport, isn't it, at this level, and we just got to make sure we get those areas right. Hi, mate. Appreciate you joining us. Always appreciate your time. Well done tonight as well. Great contest. Yeah, I appreciate it, Goldie. Thank you. Great to have Jeff uh, do that interview with Chris Gibbs. Uh, Batesy, as a coach, we've just heard uh, the importance of coaching good technique. We know that it is paramount. How do you actually coach it? What do these players go through? Yeah, it is a challenge because, as Chris said, then, you know, especially around breakdown time, you're trying to move bodies and stuff like that, and sometimes those bodies are low, so it is it is really challenging, you know, and you're, you're told to move them with shoulders and stuff like that. But I think if you can take anything from it is the ability to keep your feet underneath you when you're clean. And I think if you keep your feet underneath you when you're clean means you're not launching, and that's going to win you half the battle. So the first red card that we saw, of course, was on Tuesday, Nepo La Lala. It was reckless. Uh, he's been banned for three weeks, Mills. Uh, and something needs to change here, doesn't it? Oh, I, I definitely think so. I think in terms of this, I mean, there's also personal responsibility from sort of players to make sure, you know, you know he's gone in there and um, on, a, on a player that's actually trying to get out of it. I get it. You know, these 
guys. It's a, it's a physical game in terms of what they're trying to do. They're trying to move bodies and, you know, they're, di they're different creatures, the forwards as well, because when you move bodies and someone that's been really niggly and you hit them out of the way, um, it sort of ends up a bit later. They're not going to go there again. In this situation, that was totally totally off the board. It wasn't, it wasn't necessary. And you're going to hurt someone. And compared to a situation, Batesy, that we, we seen last night when Slipper it was been an absolute you know, a menace, um, it slowed the, the you know the ball right down and and then um, you know Tualima comes in and, and has to do you know something about it because he's actually slowing slowing their ball you know he's actually on the on the chest his chest is on, is, is on the body and that's where guys get frustrated because it's acts like that I, I disagree that that was a, a red card be interesting to see what Basie sort of thinks in terms of what I just said I, I think that has to be a red card because he's hit him in the head you know what I mean I think it has to be and that's the rules but I do agree with you the fact that the first offence there is that's a ruck, and Slipper's putting his hands on the ball. So as a rugby player and as a coach, you are told, you are told, that you'll tell your players, you're telling me, get rid of bodies over the ball, get rid of bodies over the ball. So he has no, he has no um, other place to hit, unfortunately, than his head. So you talk about technique, what he probably needs to do is, unfortunately for him, is go there and just hold Slipper in that ruck. And, and I get that too, and the referees are now following that, that process. The thing that scares me when they say this process is if anything is on the head, if any, anything sort of hits the head, you know, they work from you know, the red card sort of down. But then you get a scenario like um, you know, a Caleb Clark incident, you know, where he's actually jumped in the air, and then we've seen the result of that, and the player has been hit on the head, but you know, different situation. But, you know, is, does that then say, well, because he's hit his, hit, hit his head, do we work from the red sort of down? I mean, how, how is Caleb, you know, meant to move, move from that? Yeah, so to me, it comes back to player welfare. Yeah. And the line Caleb jumped there, there was no other option but for him to hit him in the head. So if, to me, I don't know, you guys might disagree, but there was never going to be any other outcome, if he charged it down or not. So player welfare, to me, is the most important thing, and referees have to be consistent. When there is, when there is um, forced to someone's head, that's endangering player welfare. They have to be consistent. That's why the red cards are coming. I, I, I don't. I don't. You know, I, I disagree with that because how do you how do you determine what Caleb Clark has to do? I mean, are you going to say, okay, I've got to i got to determine player welfare. I can't jump and try and charge it down. If he char if he gets up and catches the ball and charges it down and hits him in the head, is that then a red card? And, and the responsibility is on Caleb to say, hey, you, you're supposed to take your responsibility in sort of in terms of player welfare. You can't move in the air. He's taking an opportunity. He's got three, it's three options. I go up in the air and try and charge it down. I let him go past and try and chase. Or do I just pull out? There's no way in, this, in, in a sport that's, that's moving this fast that you're going to go, oh, mate, you have, you have a go and I'll try and, and chase that. So it's split, de split decisions. And I get the player welfare mm. scenario, but I think there needs to be a discussion on different scenarios, you know, compared to what Nipolo Lalo done and what, what happened with the slipper incident as well. Yeah, I, I agree. The slipper incident and Nipa, I think, are very different. I think the Caleb one is a grey area. I'm not saying it's right what happened, yeah. but the one thing I do know is that one of the on the field, one of the things were said by the referee was you were never in a realistic opportunity to catch the ball. I disagree. I disagree. If you look at the thing, he misses it by about that much. So if he catches the ball, he runs 100 metres, the same thing happens, there's still a player on the ground runs 100 metres, is that still a red card? Well, let's hear from the head coach of the Blues, Leo McDonald. Does he agree with you, Batesy? I'd like to see what's happened previously in, in, in similar situations, and, and there'll, there'll be some cases around the world at some point around the same situation. And it'll be interesting, and um, it'll probably be the first thing we look at. And, um, and what factors? Um, I think I, I, the, the comms I heard, he got time to jump wrong, so um, I need to understand what that means as well. Is it too early or too late? I thought he jumped quite early, you know, trying to get him alone to kick. Um, so does that mean he needs to jump late? I'm not sure. You know, what was the right time to jump? <laughs> Well, Leon wants to see examples uh, of other instances from overseas, and there has been one. 2018, CJ Stander on Pat Lambie. Charles, is this the same incident? To me, I mean, the, to me, this is exactly the same. This is a player not jumping into the line of, of where, the, where the leg is and where the kick's coming from, but it's directly into a player and directly into to someone's head. Mills, you might have a different opinion to me, like you've, you've played a lot of fullback, so you're in that position quite a lot where you've got players coming in and charging at you. But to me, you're coached to charge where the kick's coming from, where the leg's coming from, not directly at a player in the head. I get the Caleb situation's different because of the angles um, and where he's jumping from, 
But if the, if the outcome to me is going to be that you're making contact with the head, regardless of if you're going for the ball or not, that's an infringement. Yeah, and don't get me I think that's probably one of the issues. I yeah. think the outcome is absolutely horrific the in worst, terms of that. It's it? the worst possible outcome. Lambie but having to retire. We don't also early. want referees to ref on the outcome. You know, this is a guy that's gone up in the air and actually and try to compete for the ball and go up. Of course you're going to do it. I've been in multiple times. I actually wanted to stick a foot out to try and stop them rather than go. But you're not going in to a, a charging down and going, oh, man, I've, I've got to think about the player welfare of, of the person. And so what worries me is that if someone goes down and they're not injured, all of a sudden the referees are now, are now refereeing based on the outcome and who's there. And, and that's, that's where the grey area comes. They need to have a really good discussion about how that works in terms of a, a charging. Because the last thing we want is guys just going, I may have a free ride, you know, because you know, I'm not going to be able to contest for that. Well, it's good that we're starting the discussion, isn't it? Because it is a very important conversation to have and we know that player welfare is paramount. Uh, now, coming up next, we have Dan Carter coming on the programme. He's not here in studio, uh, but he is uh, at a very very local rugby ground. Here's a teaser to DC's greatest kicks, as told by him. But the thing with this one is, I shanked it. And because I shanked it, it made it banana even more. So not many people know that. I was like, yeah, and no, I was trying to do all that. So I'm confessing here for the first time. Dan, we're going through some of your greatest kicks today, um, ahead of what you're doing 24 hours for UNICEF. Um, all the way back in 2003 against Wales. Look at you. I know, pimply-faced uh, little <laughs> creature. So here was my first kick in the black jersey, and I was like, I can't miss, I can't miss. I took so long, I did not normally take this long. I was at the back of my run-up just freaking out. Look, I was thinking about, I never take that many breaths at the back of my run-up. And as soon as I saw it sail through the post, this huge weight just went off my shoulders. I was like, okay, cool, I can, I can start playing, you know, playing properly now. So there was just so much nervous energy going through my body there. And right now, a huge amount of relief. Like, okay, cool. This is that famous kick, right? Like, when I watch this, I'm like, how do you do that? That night it was just so windy, and if I kicked it, the wind would have just taken it, just and it would have been almost kicking into the wind. So I was like, right, I'll put it on a huge angle like this, um, and I'll try and banana it around. See the balls on an yeah. angle like that. So if I slice it, it'll actually use the wind to bring it around. But the thing with this one is, I shanked it. <laughs> And because I shanked it, it made it banana even more. So not many people know that. I was like, yeah, and no, I was trying to do all that. And I was trying to banana it, but I actually did miss it that one a little bit. So I'm confessing here for the first time. Talk us through this moment. So this is against Australia in Sydney in 2009. You're down. Down his kick. So this is my first test match back after my Achilles injury. To walk off that field to know that I helped the boys um, beat Australia in a very difficult time, 2009, so the, the team had just lost a couple of test matches to South Africa in the, the prior weeks. So it was, a, it was a really special feeling to go to the change room and go, OK, this is, this is what I've missed. Another drop kick coming up on the left boot this time, and he gets it through Dan Carter, and uh, they win the test match. I can't believe two of my kicks in this highlights reel have been miss-hits. <laughs> Like that, so is a, that is a dead duck. If you can see an end on view, it wobbles its way through the post. Do you feel those moments when you nail a kick and the crowd just erupts? Yeah, I love it. I yeah. have done that on so many occasions on my backyard, but to actually replicate and, and do it in, in a test match is something special. So now we're in my last game. So you've seen the first game. Yeah. Nervous little kid to someone that's playing with just real control. I felt like my whole career, all the setbacks, all the adversity that I've had to deal with at World Cups, it was all down to this moment, this 80 minutes. All well, through my career, I really idolised Johnny Wilkinson and that drop goal that he got. And there was a part of me that always wanted a special moment in a World Cup final like him. And then I later realised, well, no, I just get as much satisfaction about changing the momentum of a game. So yes, I got a drop goal, but it was the momentum shift that the team needed in a moment like that. What about that moment? Everyone was yelling at Bodhi at that moment. Everyone oh. was yelling at their TV. Oh, you so were, right were we. There. We were at the back, like, go! Oh, like, you were yelling as well, like, yeah. I'm like, just the icing on the cake, something 
really special. Now you compare my first ever kick to my last kick in the black jersey, this one was fast. I did this really quickly. I didn't want anyone to see exactly what I was doing. Yeah. But early in the tournament I was having a conversation with Aaron Smith and Liam Messon and they were you ever kick the conversion with your wrong foot? And I was like, no, but I'd love to. I'd absolutely love to. And he was, they were like, well, World Cup final, we're ahead by seven points, do it. I was like, okay, sweet. So that was, it was a bet. But it was a bit of a tribute to my father, who taught me in the goalposts at Southbridge to kick off both feet. I never had the opportunity, so to be able to do that on my last kick in the black jersey was, yeah, it was a pretty special moment. So to be able to sign off on that note and help the team create history by winning back-to-back -back World Cups, by being the first all-black side to win a World Cup outside of New Zealand. It was just so much joy from that moment when the final whistle went to celebrating with the team in the change room. It was, yeah, that and my first game in the black jersey were two absolute highlights of my career. One of the most amazing rugby careers that we will ever bear witness to. Mills, you got to play many of those games alongside him. Uh, from the start to the end, that final kick for his father, Neville. Oh, so special too. And you, when you meet, meet Neville, Matt, you talk to him, and he's so chilled. You know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have thought he would have sat there with DC and sort of said, do this. And I know he taught him how, you know, how to kick and stuff as a youngster, but he's just as chilled as DC. So a wonderful moment, you know, for, for Dizzy to be able to fin finish his career and kick him with his right foot. Some of us can't even kick with more. I can't. I can't play. <laughs> right well, Charles, right you're a kicker here, so you yeah, can give us nah. some insights. You would have grown up watching this guy. Oh, he's he's my favourite rugby player of all time. And I mean, uh, uh, hey. <laughs> hey, sorry, sorry, guys. I like I like you, Batesy. <laughs> anyway, for for someone to be able to sit there like that and watch footage of themselves, as he said himself, as a young pimply teenager, um, debuting in the All Black jersey, right through to you know, winning a World Cup and then kicking a goal off his other foot. It's just uh, unreal stuff. Well, he's going to be kicking several goals on Thursday. 1,598 conversions. I hope he started stretching his hips. Already. Yeah, Honestly. all raising money <laughs> for UNICEF. It is going to be fantastic. And we'll have the live stream for 24 hours on Sky Sport as well. But time now to welcome in a two-time Rugby World Cup winner, one of the greats from Australia, Tim Horan. Thank you so much for your time. What did you think of the glorious career that was Dan Carter since we made you watch it? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, great to be on the show. I can't believe that I got on this early and sit through four and a half minutes of Dan Carter's <laughs> kicks that he beat the Wallabies with. <laughs> uh, an amazing player, and um, I've got to know DC pretty well the last four or five years and um, and just understand what he does. You know, we all knew what he did on the field, but what he did off the field was probably more important and, you know, more of a legacy and what he's still continuing to do, obviously, in Australia and around the world. So, DC, well done and, and looking forward to seeing how the 24-hour goes. Well, we're going to get stuck into Super Rugby very soon, but we hear there's a big announcement coming out of Rugby Australia HQ tomorrow. What's that about? Can you give us any insights? Um, no, I think there's there's certainly, I, I'm not sure whether it's the private equity piece or it's another sponsor, but I think they're pretty close now to what's happening with the private equity piece and obviously similar what's happened with the All Blacks. Um, the Rugby Australia has been looking for a long time to, to try and work out what's happening in private equity, but also the funding has come in from the federal government for Rugby World Cup bid 2027, so it could be that. I'm not privy to what's going to happen, but uh, the Wallabies have got into camp today, so a 40-man Wallaby um, camp on the Gold Coast today. I'm heading down there tomorrow to do a couple of interviews of the players, so it might be something around that 2027 World Cup, as I reckon we're getting pretty close to, to uh, nailing that down, hopefully. Tim, so we're about to do the old crossover soon with, the, uh, with Super Rugby Pacifica. Uh, I mean, how is things shaping up? What, in terms of what have you, you, you've seen, and um, you know, particularly around your depth? Yeah, I think Mills. Um, obviously, round ten in Melbourne, Super Round. There'll be uh, three days, of course, and all the twelve teams competing. Um, six matches, so two on Friday, two Saturday, and two the Sunday afternoon, our time. Um, so, looking forward to, to seeing that. But I think that's, and I've always said this all along. We obviously had the Reds and the Brumbies last night, number one and two in the table, of course. I know the Kiwi teams are one or two games off behind us, but um, a, a decent match. But I think the real Super Rugby Pacific will start in round 10 when you know, the New Zealand teams come to Melbourne and start to see how we can deliver. Uh, I think 
the Queensland Reds Mills and also the Brumbies have got to the stage now and they're probably um, transition that they can match it and potentially win a couple of games. But other three teams, Rebels, Force and the Waratahs, I think for those three teams, they've still got a bit to go. I mean, the Reds were, were very strong against the Brumbies. The Brumbies, as you know, were the only team in Super Rugby Pacific to have not lost a game until last night at uh, Suncorp Stadium in Brisbane. Yeah, hey Tim, um, so as a Reds man, you must be pretty happy with the Reds sitting top of the table, playing over 100 games for them. Um, what do you think the Reds and the Brumby, all the Australian teams are going to have to nail uh, heading into this uh, super, super round in Melbourne, coming up against the New, Ze New Zealand teams? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's got to be up-tempo and um, the, I think the fitness levels probably helped us playing you know, our six or seven rounds leading into this round 10 to, to one, get our fitness level up, but two, to get our skill level up to a position where we actually can match it with the New Zealand teams. And that's, that's I think our skills in the backs have improved a lot in the last two or three years, but, but the forwards are the tip passes, the way they can sort of not always go to ground. I think that we're trying to stay off the ground a little bit more and uh, we've still got a bit to go, certainly, but uh, yeah, looking forward to it in Melbourne in a few weeks' time. It's going to be, uh, you know, six cracking games and, and I think the Fiji and Drew are what they've added to the competition as well and Mills, you would have seen it, obviously, the last couple of weeks where, you know, the way that they've performed, I know they lost their last two games, but, you know, the couple of games I called, they had three tries in the last five minutes of two games, so they can definitely deliver, um, but yeah, we're looking to seeing the competition really start in round 10. Tim, you talk about the Reds and how they've rebuilt over the years and to be at the top of the, the peak in the Australian competition. What are you seeing from the Tars? Because they certainly look a lot better than they were last year. Are you seeing, are you seeing a similar thing go on with that camp? Being a Reds man, you might not care, but <laughs> I'd still like your opinion. Oh, no, I think for the Waratahs, I was really impressed. I watched their three trial games this year and they won against the Brumbies, the Queensland Reds and, and I think another team... In, I just think they've got a good young team coming through. Darren Coleman, the new coach, he's a, a coach that um, allows these players to express themselves. And and I think he's built... And this, this young team's been together for two, maybe three years now. So they na need to deliver this year. And Michael Hooper, of course, came back on uh, Friday night and played his first game back from a long layoff from injuring his foot in the um, European Test Series last year. So... Good core group of players, young players, but also players that they're sort of old enough now, experienced enough now, they have to deliver. So, and for us in Australia, we, we need, I think about 62 or 63% of our fan base is from New South Wales. So we need a good New South Wales team. We need them in the top eight, hopefully uh, in a couple of months' time. Tim, I want to talk about a totally different team, and that's uh, the refereeing. So obviously they're going to cross over as well. We just had a hot debate in terms of player welfare. Is there anything that sort of concerns you about sort of the different interpretations from, I suppose, what's happened in New Zealand and then coming together with the Australian referees? No, I think the referee's been pretty consistent uh, between Australia and New Zealand, which, which is great. But my biggest concern, Mills, is what world rugby is um, forcing on the referees down under. And, and we, as you guys know, we're obviously competing against NRL and AFL, like really big codes in Australia. So we need... Um, we need our games to be, you know, quick and quick decisions from TMOs, the right decisions and move on quickly. Otherwise, if you've got a channel changer and you're watching TV on a Saturday night and you're watching rugby and, and it's taking two or three minutes and six replays for a TMO to make a decision, you're going to jump on and go to NRL. Yeah. Or you're going to go and watch an Aussie rules game. So I actually think in time we need to adapt our laws down under for Super Rugby in conjunction with um, New Zealand to be able to have the game quicker and speed the game up. Um, I get all the welfare issues. I get the yellow cards, red cards. I'm all for that at the right time. But I think we need to adapt our laws down under here, Australia and New Zealand, to make the game more watchable for the viewer. Tim, you've been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for giving up your time, for sitting through the Dan Carter track. And bring on round 10. We are coming for those top two spots in Super Rugby Pacific. Good stuff, guys. Look forward to uh, welcoming you all over in Melbourne and uh, Mills. Hopefully we can take you out for a little Malibu of milk on the Friday night. <laughs> oh, Malibu. Good on you, mate. 4X, buddy. <laughs> 4X. What's that about, Mills? 
Oh, I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Those Aussies, don't trust them. Don't trust them. Yeah, he's a good man. I mean, it's going to be good, isn't it? Round 10, super round. So all the teams converge on Melbourne. And the Kiwi teams will be looking for this because they get somewhat of a break from these derbies, Charles. Yeah, oh, I think it's exciting for everyone, isn't it? For Kiwis and Aussies and, and everyone playing and watching. Um, the What happened last year as well, I mean, we played each other so many times. So... For us to go over and finally get this um, Super Rugby Trans-Tasman kicked off, it's going to be exciting. And one game I'm really looking forward to is Moana Pacifica versus Fiji and Drua. I think that's going to be just two teams showing their, their pride of, of who they're representing and two new teams. And, yeah, that's going to be awesome. Well, you've all been show-stopping tonight. Thank you both so much uh, for coming in. Thanks once again, Mills. We hope you've enjoyed the breakdown tonight. We'll be back same time, same place next Sunday. Ka kite anō. With a lovely no look pass, they are all class. Just too much power. Offloads the ball in the tackle. Anton Lewis.